Welcome to the No Limit Selling Podcast, where industry leaders share their advice on how you can become better, stronger, faster. Hey, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the No Limit Selling Podcast. And one of the joys that I get is my highest value is learning new things. And when I have brilliant guests on the show, I get to do that, right? And today we're joined by Jennifer Watson Laws. She's a senior vice president at HW Media. Jennifer, welcome to the program. Hi, Mara. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Oh, my pleasure. You know, one of my favorite questions of all times is sometimes somebody does something and a supervisor asks, oh, why did you do that? And as soon as you ask that why question, the person automatically goes in a defensive mode sure. and is like, uh, well, what are you blaming me? What are you doing? The question I love to ask is, how did you decide to do that? And that person stops dead in their tracks and they usually look up and they go, oh, I decided and gives you their thought process on how they did that. And it allows you to be a better coach. Any thoughts on that little mind hack, uh, Jennifer? Yeah, I think that's actually a really interesting switch of, of, of thought process and approach. Mm. And one thing that I have learned over the years, and especially recently, as we are in this more difficult economic climate, and we've had to balance and juggle and, and have some, some difficult conversations, whether that's with a client who may be pulling back or, mm. you know, with an internal, an internal party that, that, you know, we need to make some changes or we need to make some, some cho tough choices. It's not necessarily meaning that they're exiting the, the company or the organization, but just, you know, we need to make sure that we are as efficient as possible. And I think one thing that I have learned is, is your approach to having a conversation is really, really important. And I think getting that back leads to even better conversations. And so asking somebody, how did you arrive at that decision? Or can you walk me through your, your thought process? Or how did, how did we, how did we get here? I think yeah. that's really a, a much more kind question as opposed to why did you make that? How could you have decided that? Because it definitely, it puts somebody immediately in a defensive format. It, it makes people feel like they are, you're questioning their ability to make a decision and you are conveying disagreement with what they decided when that may not be the case at all. Absolutely. Because part of it is like mind reading, like, uh oh, what's, what's the agenda here? So I love that. And I think that's what leadership is about, especially in our industry, which is, which is sales, because sales is where mindset meets business because it's all about, you know, what's happening here between our ears. So I'll give you a good example. You know, prospecting is a critical part of the sales process. Sure. Without that, nothing happens. But as the landscape changes with digital marketing and people working from home, how are you guiding your folks on how to prospect in this day and age to do it effectively? Yeah, so it, it definitely has been difficult. I think we particularly have been fortunate in that while we have seen a slowdown in commitments and a slowdown in, in spend, we have not seen a slowdown in engagement. We have really great relationships with our clients and our partners, and everybody really feels like they're in the same boat, and they're not afraid to have a conversation. We're not getting the stiff arm. We're mm. not getting the the pushback on, oh, you know, I don't want to meet. Everybody is absolutely willing to have a conversation, and they're being very opportunistic about what they are choosing to invest in and what they are choosing to engage with. So the recommendation to my teams has been don't stop until you get a no and be creative, but you have to hold to what your ideal customer is. Who who are our ideal customers? And don't be tempted to stray because those deals are not going to work out. So as tempting as it might be to stray and and take money from somebody that that may or may not fit make sure that you know that what we are partnering on is going to be successful. Don't get, don't get distracted um, by prospects or conversations that aren't going to be fruitful. Absolutely. So I think a couple of things you said there were like really important. One of them was know who your target audience is. Cause once you know that you really have a good sense of like what's going on for them. You can put your finger on their pulse, you know, their concerns and challenges, but it's so tempting 
to go after a shiny object. And so how do you instruct your managers to, you know, don't shut down creativity, but also don't let people get distracted? Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and I think that definitely is, is tempting. I mean, as salespeople, we put a, we put a goal in front of them and said, Hey, (laughs) your job is to, is to hit this goal. Come what may, I don't care how you get there, just get there. But at the same time we say, Hey, be mindful. So we talk about ideal customer profile in terms of a target. Your ideal customer is the bullseye. And that ideal customer checks all the boxes. And from Mm. that, you have concentric circles that build out from that, that bullseye. And you need to hold both active clients and prospective clients to that standard. Where are they on the, on the target? And that should guide how much time, effort, and thought, and thought process that you put towards that client. It doesn't mean that, for example, a, a company that is just on a shoestring budget and maybe pre-funding doesn't mm-hmm. mean that we should get to know them, but we need to moderate the time and effort that we put towards us and put more time and effort towards the people that are closer to the bullseye and our ideal customer profile. So get to know those people that have a startup, for example, but be thoughtful about when and how you spend time with them. So if you're in market, maybe have coffee with that person. Don't take them Mm. to dinner. Don't take them to lunch. Don't meet them at two o'clock in the afternoon. Have Be thoughtful about when and where and how you are spending your time in relation to those clients and prospects that are going to deliver the biggest, biggest win. Absolutely. Cause I think that's our currency in sales is time. Absolutely. And there's and not enough of it. And it's so seductive and easy to be really, really busy and ineffective. Mm-hmm. Yes. And there's, we all can fill our day with busyness. We all can fill our day with what comes in our e- email inbox. That doesn't mean that you're moving the rock forward. And that's one of the things that I am really a big proponent of is what did you do today? What are you doing today that's going to move your rock forward? I love that. And then it's a great kind of Atlas kind of metaphor too. It's like, (laughs) take that boulder up the hill. It's amazing how those Greek uh, myths still serve us well today because it was always about the human condition and sales Mm -hmm. has changed in many ways. But at the end of the day, it's still one human being communicating and solving a problem for another. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think the one of the real challenges is how to cut through the noise and how to get the attention of the decision maker and how do you reach them? I know that is something that that people on my team come up against all the time. Is it picking up the phone? Is it texting them? Is it DMing them on social media? Is it sending them an email? Is it sending them a video? I mean, there's just so many different ways. And I think that while we think maybe it's simplified things, it has made things really, really complicated. And for the receiver, my goodness, it's 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 overwhelming and and be, you become kind of immune to some things that you're getting thrown at you. And it's it's a hard plight being a salesperson. Absolutely. And like some of my folks, it's like, Umar, you can send the newsletter out on this day. It has to be on a Tuesday. And it's like, True, but that's probably like half a 1% more open rate on that day. But people are so bombarded with so much stuff. Like, uh, does it really make a difference? Right. So it is tough getting that ability to grab the attention of the person you're trying to attend. Mm -hmm. I was, there's a company in Baltimore called Agora Publishing. And what they do is they sell financial advice. And they write these reports and internet marketers write emails. So I was asking some of them, consulting for the company, not in that area, but you know how to do better in sales. And they said they spent 50% of their time figuring out the subject line compared to the you know, four yep. pages of text because wow. they don't open that email. It doesn't matter how brilliant the rest of the text is. Yep. Hundred percent. We talk a lot about making sure that your outreach, especially your initial outreach, before you have made connection, made a contact, needs to be succinct to get their attention in the amount of space, the number of characters and words that fits on the preview of your on your on your mobile phone. That's all that counts, right? That uh, <laughs> preview. Yeah. Yeah. So what, and what's the best practice? 
Oh, please go ahead. You were about to say? No, no. I was just going to say that serves two purposes. One, it makes sure that you are getting to the point quickly, but it also, you have to be really, really thoughtful about your, your how and why. So sometimes it focuses in, focuses in people. I think there's a quote from Abraham Lincoln uh, when he wrote a letter. This letter would have been shorter if I had more time to write it. <laughs> right, right. But as a stream of consciousness otherwise. Absolutely. And so what is your best practice that your folks are using or you guys are saying, okay, on a totally cold contact, is it like reach out on research on LinkedIn first, then reach out there? Like, what are you guys uh, finding effective? So. It varies from person to person. I am not a fan of the reach out and connect on LinkedIn and then send an email. I I personally can spot that a mile away. I know when someone's yes. trying to connect with me to try and sell me something and I'm never mm. going to connect with them. I'm just I'm just not. Mm. You know, I've kind of gotten to the point where I want my LinkedIn network to be to be useful. I want it to be people that I actually know and not go, um, who the heck is this? So we do a lot of research on LinkedIn. We use LinkedIn Sales Navigator. We we work really, really hard to find the right person. And then we send thoughtful emails. We call them and we follow up. And we know it takes seven or eight times before we get somebody's attention. But we also mix it up. It's not always about trying to sell them something. It's sharing articles. I mean, we are a... a news and information services companies. So we have articles on the industry that these people might be interested in reading. We have podcasts that they might be interested in learning. We use some of those tactics. So it's not always about, hey, I'm trying to sell you something. We try to use other hooks, but I wouldn't by any stretch of the imagination say that we have the secret sauce or have mastered that. I'll let you know if we do. (laughs) Uh, Because you won't be working there. You'll be like on stage somewhere. So what's kind of interesting on the beat. Is, is like, there's enough data out there in the world that nobody needs more data, but what's really important is insight. And I guess that's what you guys provide is here's the insight that you need to know. And I'll give you a recent example that I came across. Like I know when countries go to war, it's like, if I grab a hold of Texas, you know, I got oil and I got this and I got that, which kind of makes sense. But recently I was reading something. It was, they want the human beings as well, because they want GDP. And I never thought of that. Is when they take over, they want factories and production. And it's like, yeah. huh. Like that was an insight for me. Not that I'm planning to invade Texas anytime soon. <laughs> Come on down. But if we want to add value to our current clients and prospective new clients, if we can give them that insight, then it's like, huh, Jennifer's really smart. I should keep an eye out for her. I had done, so my area of expertise is all about mindset. Mm -hmm. You know, what beliefs in here stop us from executing? Because you probably have people that you lead that you can go, oh my God, John would be a, he's going to be a rock star if only he. So I did one of those presentations and somebody three years later reached out and said, hey, Umar, I need some help. Can you help me? I said, sure. He said, you know, we met when you did this thing. I thought you were so brilliant. And I've been stalking you for three years. I look at all your posts and he never commented, never shared. And it's like, dude, one of those once in a while would have helped, you know, to keep it going, but just right. put out good content. When you connect yeah. with prospective clients, add a value. You just don't know what kind of impact that has. And when they're ready, you're top of mind. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. We're, we're all about adding, adding value. And that's why we use content to try to get somebody to connect with us. And, Mm. you know, if they, if they're not in the market to buy something, that's okay. A no is closer to a yes. So that's okay. Engage. We're happy to share with you the information. And if you become a, a reader of one of our newsletters or a listener of one of our podcasts or come to one of our events, that's a win too. Yes, I'm, you know, selling advertising and, and marketing alongside side the content that we produce. But I also sell housing market data and mm. we sell event tickets. We sell, you know, all kinds of different things. So however you want to engage, that's that's great. Yes, is my end goal to sell you advertising or data? 100 <laughs> percent But I want to provide value to you as I'm trying to as I'm trying to develop a relationship with you. And I think no takes effort. Like, it's so easy for me to ignore someone, 
which yeah. is, but if they say no, that shows this level of interest. And so that's a good sign. Right. It's when Absolutely. you get a, a no. Right. Is it, is it no, never or no, not for right now. In fact, I got one an email this morning and they said, you know, other priorities we want to do, if we're going to do this, we want to do it right. And our current priorities won't allow us to do that. So it's no for right now. Yeah. I love that. That's, that's almost as good as a yes. I'm great. Uh, you know, when should I reconnect with you? And once you get past that initial thing, you kind of develop a relationship with that person. If they were open enough to share with you, then you have the ability to say, you know, I've been sending you a lot of stuff. What's really been valuable for you? And they'll say, you know, that stuff was really good. This stuff, not so much. So yeah, building that relationship goes a long way. So what would you say are some of the strategies for doing that research? You talked about, you know, we do a lot of research. Yep. And some salespeople can be caught up in research and that becomes their way of not actually doing the things they need to. So what would be a strategy for doing research in an effective way that leads to conversations? Yeah, absolutely. I think that there is some background homework that you and Mm. your organization and your sales leader and your marketing department need to come together on. And that is making sure that you have a really, really well-defined ideal customer profile. You know who the stakeholders are on the other side of the table. You know why your current customers buy why they stay, why they don't buy, and what is your value prop? What are you providing to them? Yes, I could be selling you an ad in a magazine, but what is the value of that? What are you getting Mm. as a result of that? I need to understand that as a salesperson so I can talk effectively to you about why you should do this, why the next customer should do it. So that's the homework that needs to be done first. And then as an individual salesperson, you need to stay within the confines and the framework of that and don't stray beyond that. So for example, we know that our ideal client has a robust marketing department. Now, again, your ideal client checks all the boxes. So does that mean that every marketing department we work with has 20 people in it? No. Would we like it to? Absolutely. But The question is, do they have a marketing department? So who is the marketing leader? They don't have to have a CMO, but who's the director of marketing? Who is the The director of Yeah, whatever, whoever it is. And find out who that person is and reach out directly to to that person. And don't, don't go in with, hey, you probably are not the right person. Work harder to find the work harder to find the right person and don't get caught up in the analysis paralysis of finding about everything about the company before you reach out. You do do need to know enough so you can have an educated conversation and you know what it is that you're trying to sell them or talk to them about, but you don't need to read anything and everything. I worked for somebody one time that said that you should read their a company's annual report before you go mm-hmm. and meet with them, which okay. You know, if you're selling large enterprise, whatever, that is seven figures, okay, maybe, and you sell maybe one or two of them a year, that may make sense. But for somebody who is selling on a consistent basis and needs to have multiple wins a week, you don't have time to do that. So don't get mired down in in all the research that you need to do. You need to know enough to understand whether or not they fit your ideal customer profile and then find the person that is the most likely person to to do that. And don't be creepy. Don't say, oh, hey, I saw that you went to this and such and this and such. My sister's neighbor's yeah. boyfriend went there. That's <laughs> creepy. <laughs> yes, that is creepy. So a couple of things that come up there. Number one, the annual report. One of the ways to kind of manage that is to stick it in chat GTP and just say, <laughs> and ask them to please summarize. analyze this and let me know three points that are trigger events that I should know and let it do it and go, here's three and that's good enough. And you didn't have to spend all this time researching it. And by the way, I'm getting a chat GDP tattoo right on my forehead. It's like so useful. It, it is. It's, it's a great tool. I've started to use it. Once I write something, I'll put it in there to see what it says, but I do find that it takes some heavy editing. It tends to be a little, it's a little, absolutely. 
<laughs> you have to draw back. And one of the things that I've noticed in people reaching out to me, salespeople reaching out to me to try and sell me something is they'll have some random sentence at the end of the email that says, Hey, this I see tell. that you're in, in Dallas. Have you heard about this restaurant? What that it, yeah. it, it's, you know, it's, you can tell, yeah, you can go too far. You can totally tell. And that's, I'm never going to respond to that. So I think that's, that is another thing that, that salespeople have to be, to be genuine. Absolutely. And I think the, another tip on finding the right person is go directly to the CEO of the company because they have somebody that actually runs the company. That's their admin. And as soon as you hit that person, it's like, oh no, you don't want Janet. You want to talk to this person. And so sometimes I've used that quite effectively on get finding the right person. Because if you go to the receptionist, whoever that person is, sometimes they don't know, but right. you go upstream, they know exactly who it is and, and you right. move forward. Right. So in the old days, oh, by the way, here's a joke, Jennifer, before we move forward, forward, do you know the difference between networking and not working is just one letter. So back in the days when we used to go networking, it was still a, if you did it well, it was an effective way of using your time to actually further your business. But in this post pandemic world, a lot of that stuff isn't happening. So there's some virtual networking kind of opportunities. Any thoughts on that? Does that work? Doesn't work? I, I have not found it to be effective. I think it's it's really difficult. We all spend so much time in a virtual environment all through the day that I think people are just spent. They're just exhausted. And the, the lack of awareness of somebody of somebody being a three-dimensional person is is really difficult. You don't you don't know them. And I just have not found them to be found them to be as effective or rewarding as Mm. as in person. But I think there's a time and a place and there's a you have you have to do the best that you can with what you have available. So if it's not possible to meet in person, I do appreciate the ability to see somebody versus not seeing somebody. Absolutely. So can you well frame it up first the question. Sometimes you get people that are new to the industry and they're young and dumb. So I was working with this company out in uh, Silicon Valley and it was an initiative to go reach out to your ideal clients and this person that just joined new out of university, kind of landed a significant meeting at Apple. And all the senior reps were like, how did you do that? Like, how does that work? And it's just like not knowing and just going for it. Yep. So yep. how do you help, you know, your team to gen- set aside what they think they know and just be bolder and more driven? Because sometimes we're our worst enemy. Right. Yeah, I, I think that I think that's really a tough one. I have a great salesperson on on my team. She has been with the company for gosh, probably 13, 14 years at this mm-hmm. at this point. And new business development prospecting is one of her absolute favorite things to do. And very early on, I tell this story a lot. Very early on, she and I were at a conference and we were at dinner with a group of other of people. And there was the CEO of a company that she had been trying to get in to see leaving the restaurant kind of as we were sitting down. And she chased him down out, out, the, out of the restaurant to get an appointment. She got an yeah. appointment for the next day. Now, that's her style. That mm. works for her. She was able to pull that off. I, that's not my thing. That's not, mm. how I would not have been able to pull that off. So what I tell people is you have to find what works for you. Yes. Do, trying to do what works for somebody else in that type of instance, trying to make somebody else's whatever work for you is not going to work. It's never going to come off right. And it's not going, you're not going to be successful. You have to find what works for you, but you have to find it. You can't just say, oh, I don't have it. I don't know what it is. You, If you're going to be in sales, you have to find out what it is. That's hers. And she's been extremely successful doing that. She knows so many people. And at a conference up and down the aisles in an expo hall, she'll go yeah. to every single booth. And nine times out of 10, she knows somebody along the way because she, this is what she is. needs her. And this is how she does it. And she... I mean, you know, that's what works for her. And she leans in. 
I have another salesperson who has endless energy and motivation and enthusiasm and just is like the energizer bunny. And that because he is just going to have pure numbers, Mm. he is going to be successful and he learns each time what didn't work, what did work. And he iterates. That's what's going to work for him. He wouldn't, it wouldn't work for him to go chase somebody down out of a restaurant. That's not going to work for him. And, but he work does what works for him. So when I find, uh, thank you for sharing those two stories because they're like brilliant stories. And I think there's a lot to be said for most people have three versions of themselves. Mm-hmm. One is the version they want to show the outside world. Look at me. I'm pretty. I'm smart. I'm amazing. Or look at me. I'm tragic and nothing goes right or whatever that illusion is that they show. Then they have a sense of who they are, which I call the delusion. And then they have the authentic self. And I think part of our life journey is figuring out who we are. And mm-hmm. when you figure out who you are, this is the most powerful version of you. And you can do what you do because of that. And if somebody else tries to have an illusion of, I'm going to be more outgoing, people just get a sense of it, or I'm going to be more caring and I'm not a caring person. Jennifer's antenna is going to go up and say, something's not right here. You may not know what's not right, but you'll know something's not there. Mm-hmm. So, so in my work, because my area of expertise is very much applied neuroscience and the mindset. Mm -hmm. is that you get salespeople that if we said, okay, this is a sales process plus or minus is getting the initial meeting, doing the presentation, handling objections, closing the business, and then deepening into the account. Most salespeople are not amazing at all of those. They're really strong at most of them. And there's one area where they just aren't there. And what I find is that's the area, not to force them to do it, if you can figure out what belief in their psyche is stopping them from executing that once you change that, you get another 30% performance. So a good example would be, we were talking networking earlier. This guy who's a juggernaut says, Umar, when I go networking, if I'm one-on-one, not a problem, but if I go networking, I just, I'm a wallflower. I just stay there and just let people come to me if they come to me. And so I said, okay, tell me about a particular time you went networking and you didn't feel comfortable reaching out to other people and you wanted to. He goes, sure, I can tell you about that. And he tells me the story and said, okay, go back to that moment in that event, see what you saw, the other people you wanted to connect with, whatever inner dialogue, whatever was happening in the background acoustically. He says, I'm doing it. When you do those two things, you get to re-experience what you were feeling in your body. and goes, huh, yeah, I'm feeling it now. It's a really uncomfortable feeling right in the center of my gut that I didn't want to go talk to them. And there's a tool from applied neuroscience you can use to link any feeling to the unconscious mind that records everything. And as soon as we did that, it brought up a moment in his history. Mm -hmm. He went from rural Maryland where they had a high school with like 20 people in it Uh to Baltimore city that had 2000 kids in it. First day in, in school when he went in there and this chaos with thousands of kids in going to their lockers and he felt like a fish out of water. And when he was leaving that day, what turned out to be his best friend later on, he asked, which school bus do I take? Cause there was like 50 of them. Yeah. And this guy intentionally put him on the wrong school bus. <laughs> and then being in that bus, being the last student and the, the driver looking up in the rear view mirror saying, don't worry, kid, I'll get you home. That feeling was what stopped him. That created a belief about not wanting to connect. So yeah. he went in and changed it. And for him, it's just like that barrier just lifted and he can just sure. go out and network. So that's uh, kind of what makes me happy is helping people get breakthroughs. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So, so Jennifer, before we part company, two questions. What is a book you would recommend that salespeople mm-hmm. and sales leaders read that would help them become better? So the, the one I would recommend is it's called The Challenger Sale. Oh, Matt Dixon. Yeah. Yeah, that one's really, really good. For sales leaders, one of my favorites is The Leadership Gap. gap. Mm. And it's really, really interesting. And what I like about that one is the lady who authored it, she was an executive coach for big CEOs around the world. And through her stories of what these CEOs did and how they were challenged, helped them discover what their gap was and then helped them fill that gap either by hiring additional people Mm -hmm. or whatever the case may be. But those type of situations, 
it doesn't matter that that I'm not a that I'm not a CEO. Hearing hearing those those thoughts and kind of thinking about what my own leadership gap was, those were two that that are really nice. that are they're really impactful for me. And here's the last question that might be the toughest. What's a question I should have asked you that I did not? Oh, oh, wow. Gosh, that's that's a that's a tough one. I would say what maybe what am I most proud of? Yeah. In my career? For what are you most proud of in your career? <laughs> Total setup, right? I think I am most proud of taking advantage of opportunities that they came as they came along and persevered to to be successful and just willing being willing to play the game and by that I don't mean that I you know degraded myself or lowered my expectations or or any of that but when you step into this arena in the corporate world, you have to know what you are signing yourself up for. Yeah. You have to be willing to to play by the rules or get out. And that is not to say that you shouldn't try and change the rules that are not right or outdated mm. or are no longer applicable because I think there's a lot of positive change, mm. especially when you think about women in the workplace and in those types of things that were 100% necessary. But when I signed up to be the SVP of sales, I knew what I was signing up for and what that was going to require and persevering through the tough moments and taking advantage of the opportunities that they have come along in the past 25 years of my career are two things that I'm really, really proud of. Thank you for sharing that. And just on a side note, it's the quote I like best is it wasn't a quote, but just an observation. Back in an earlier age, they had this guy called Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers. And it was about how amazing Fred Astaire was as a dancer. And the, the line that I like is, yes, Ginger Rogers did the same dance he did, only backwards and in high heels. And right. women do have to outshine their uh, male counterparts just to be seen as equal. So my hat's off to to everyone that needs to do that. Absolutely. Absolutely. And and we should be able to play the game. And those who are lucky enough to have a seat at the table should make sure that the game is is open and available to all those that want to play. Uh, absolutely. I'm uh, about to do the outro on our show. Jennifer, uh, truly, this was a really, really uh, excellent interview. I learned a lot and uh, I'm sure our listener is going to love it as well. Thanks so much for being on the show. Great. Thanks, Amar. Great to see you. Hold on, we're going to do an outro and then we'll chat for a few minutes. If you enjoyed this episode, please go to iTunes and leave a five-star rating. And if you're looking for more tools, go to my website at nolimitselling.com. I've got a free mind training course there that's going to teach you some insights from the world of neuro-linguistic programming. And that is the fastest way to get better results. 